Are you winning, son? Did your parents ever give you that disappointed look when they saw you were reading manga again? Did your high school art teacher ever discourage you from drawing manga in class? Did your friends just think you were being a degenerate? Don't worry, these people probably don't even know where Japan is. Manga art theory is an emerging field of study for an instantly recognizable art form that provides an experience that's distinctly different from all other types of media. It's a type of Japanese comic that's wildly original, popular, and read worldwide. You'll certainly know it when you see it. The only problem with manga is that for most of its existence, it hasn't been taken seriously as the art that it is. So because of this, its history and documentation are fragmented, unprofessional, and out of date. Japanese cultural critic and teacher Ito Go wants better for this type of art. Ito Go is the author of Tezuka is Dead, Postmodernist and Modernist Approaches to Japanese Comics, published in 2005. His book was kind of a big deal when it was first published. At the time and even now, there are very few texts that examine Japanese pop culture for its deeper meanings and concepts. Ito is one of a small group of Japanese academics and artists that were working during the early 2000s to create the first serious academic writings on the topic. While it may not be well known in the West, his ideas are foundational to understanding Japanese media and culture. If you're curious to know more about Japanese academic takes on pop culture, you can also check out our video on Takashi Murakami's super flat theory here. So we're looking at an excerpt from Ito's book, specifically a chapter translated by Miri Nakamura, titled Manga in Transformation and Its Dysfunctional Discourse. Nakamura's translation covers only the opening chapter, and the rest of the book remains largely untranslated as far as I know. This translated article appears in Volume 6 of the journal Mechademia from 2011. This video is an outline of Ito's ideas in this chapter, starting at the beginning. Let's talk about early manga art history. Modernist approaches to making and studying manga mark the beginning of what we recognize as manga today, old scrolls and woodblock prints aside. For our purposes, when I say modernist, I'm referring to a set of ideas and a time period that roughly spans from the late 1800s through till the 1980s. This was a time marked by the absorption of Western ideas and rapid industrial development. During these early decades, Tezuka Osamu emerged as the pinnacle of manga makers, according to Japanese modernist writers, thinkers, and fans. While a few earlier manga exist, Tezuka's unique style and approach won over hearts and minds more than the rest. He was dubbed the father of all manga, and by all rights this seemed very earned. He created mega-hits like Astro Boy, Princess Knight, Kimba the White Lion, and Blackjack, among others. Tezuka's work is undeniably important, but his towering presence in history suggests a bit of an issue. His influence is so big that it overshadows the entire medium. See, the problem with modernism is that it's prone to selecting masterpieces. And while this doesn't sound like it's bad, it's a rather simple way of looking at things. More recent ways of thinking note that some works will resonate with people more than others because, you know, subjectivity. Everyone's got different taste. Why should the idea of greatness be more important than someone's enjoyment? And why is the old always better than the new? Ito pushes back against this modernist analysis and says, what if we looked at manga with a bit more nuance? Today's manga becomes tomorrow's history, but unless we start identifying the titles that matter now, there will be major gaps in the medium's history overall. Manga's history will remain incomplete so long as it's being judged by out-of-date standards. So where to begin? Ito says a whole new framework has to be created before we can even begin to evaluate the worth or importance of any title in particular. When he wrote this chapter in 2005, he felt frustrated that the manga from the 90s to the mid-2000s wasn't getting its fair due. He goes so far as to say that manga titles from this time existed in a historical vacuum. 
He thought this had occurred because there was no consensus as to what manga history even looked like. As mentioned before, the only real manga history that existed by this point was the one that held up Tezuka as the master and origin of all manga. Furthermore, modernist thinking believed that manga could be entirely understood by its storyline and characters alone. But Ito reminds us that it's not that easy, and there are certainly a lot more factors than that at play. What about the enjoyment you get from reading it? What if a particular title really captures the spirit of the time we're living through? What if it inspires a ton of fan activity, or if there's plenty of different interpretations generated from just one chapter? All of that stuff matters, too. In 2001, a Japanese book titled Commentary on the Terminologies of Manga Culture was published. Ito points us toward a write-up on manga by Yonezawa Yoshiro. He writes, Since 2000, the number of magazines and paperbacks published has decreased across the board. And in the past year, manga has reached a point where it has not produced a single huge hit or a popular new genre. Manga will deteriorate if it cannot create works that engage with their own time and that also transcend time, works that will be read over and over. <laughs> Yonezawa then goes on to bring up One Piece and says this about the series. Quickly gained popularity due to its simple enjoyability and became a huge hit, serialized on TV and released as a theatrical anime. Ito points out that while Yonezawa complains about the state of manga, he then goes on to say how popular and influential One Piece is right in the next paragraph. Apparently this writer heralded the decline of manga every year between 1995 to 2001. This guy was one among many that claimed that manga became boring, which was a very popular complaint in Japan at the time, but he couldn't back it up. <laughs> <laughs> People that repeated this grievance could never really say why manga was getting boring, and it certainly didn't help that they never provided any reasoning for this thought, or even mention how their expectations weren't met. It was just this nagging feeling that many expressed, and it circulated for years. How can so much content be uniformly boring? While well, Ito asserts that it just isn't possible. Manga, by its very nature, isn't designed to be for any one person in particular. There's thousands of titles across various genres, all aimed at different audiences. The medium as a whole is meant to encompass variety, and if there's a lot of something that contains a lot of everything, how can one person truly get it all? Let's do a bit of a case study to expand upon the idea of multiple readings and multiple readers. Shonen Jump was established in 1968. It's long-running, best-selling, and unmatchable in its popularity. The target audience is middle school boys, but of course its content has much farther reach. Grade school readers, older students, girls and women, the general public, and so on. Ito asserts that if you were to go to a Japanese middle school, you would find all kinds of students reading this magazine, including a good percentage of girls, probably more than you'd expect. So let's say you were to talk to this group of students and ask them what they like about Shonen Jump. You'd probably get answers like, I like the characters, or the art is pretty, or the story is cool. Chances are, these readers would also tend to agree with one another, even if it wasn't their primary reason for reading. Ito even brings boys' love fans into it. Those that find homosexual relationships between characters in their readings present yet another reason for liking a series. If you don't like Yoi, you might be inclined to say that these readers are missing the point of the story. But are they? Why are the characters in one person's reading more important than another reader's understanding of them? Ito uses this example to point out that there are as many manga as there are readers. Evaluating manga's components, such as story, characters, and artwork, 
isn't really a useful way of thinking on its own because it doesn't take the reader's experiences into account. What Ito proposes is to view manga through a postmodernist lens. He writes, Story and character, intimately tied to one another, can be seen as subsystems within a larger system of manga. The goal here is first to make manga discourse conform to the present state of multiple texts and readers. Prioritizing story and character also serves to create a hierarchy of manga's traits, establishing the illusion that some components of it are more important than others when this isn't true. All features of a manga title work together to create an overall experience for the reader. Ito says that all manga-related pleasures are equally valuable, and perhaps the most useful framework that we can create to understand manga is a list of all of the ways that it creates pleasure for the reader. We can look to other forms of media to better figure out how to think about manga too. Music, for example, provides a way of understanding multiple features working together to form a whole. Music is constructed of lyrics, voice, performance, arrangement, melody, chord progression, and rhythm. Of course, one could also include elements beyond the musical composition, for example, fashion or the musician's background history. If the performance stirs the audience in a certain way, we could also consider elements like the music's connection to society, the defining issues of the era, the mood, and so on. Either way, the music is separated into different parts. Unfortunately, criticism about manga has largely remained quite surface level. Writers and viewers still talk about the quality of the art, the type of story, and their opinion on it, and that's about it. That'd be like only judging music by its melody and vocals alone. It isn't the whole picture. Some critics see manga as a text made up of drawings, and others see it as drawings that make up a text. Ito says that neither of these is fully correct, and instead he strives to recognize the whole of manga, the full environment of the experience, recognizing it as a bigger system of its own that's more than just the sum of its parts. He identifies another problem to fully understanding manga, is that some titles are seen as being better if they're produced by certain companies as opposed to others. In Japan, many older anime critics and fans don't respect Square Enix's manga titles, referred to as Gangan Gan comics. It wasn't until Full Metal Alchemist came out that many people even began to take Gangan Gan comics seriously, and even then it was judged to be a good shonen series as opposed to just a good series. It turned out that one of the reasons Gangan Gan comics weren't respected was because they had a very different influence. Unlike early manga that was shaped by film and TV, the narrative and artwork of Gangan Gan comics was heavily inspired by video games. Many critics and readers that didn't grow up with video games may not appreciate this, but it's an important development in the history of manga nonetheless, and it can't be ignored just because some people don't get it. Just like how many Japanese critics disregarded Gangan Gan comics, there will always be manga titles or genres that you don't like. Chances are you probably won't even read them to figure out why you don't like them. And this is yet another problem for manga criticism. We can't ignore what we don't like, nor can we avoid studying it. But there's a catch. If we're not actively receiving pleasure when reviewing these titles, we're not getting the full picture either. Manga is meant to bring pleasure to its readers on some level, and when it's not, you're straight up missing out on one of its key dimensions. Lastly, there's yet another large roadblock to fully understanding manga as its own art form. Manga is usually viewed as being the primary form of a franchise. It's viewed as being foundational even when it isn't. This perception came about because in previous decades, it used to be that a manga would come out, then it would be adapted into an anime, and then maybe it would become a movie or a video game. However, now anime may be made first, and a manga adaption may be made after to support the anime's brand. Light novel adaptions also began to proliferate in the 2000s, cutting manga out of the picture as a primary text entirely. A question lingers then. What if a series has a cross-media strategy where the content was planned to be released as an anime, video game, and a manga all around the same time? While we can learn a lot about themes, stories, and characters by looking at all of these media together as a whole work, but that doesn't help us to understand manga on its own merits. 
How is manga forced to compete with anime's sound and movement? Or the controls and choices of video games? Or even collectible character goods? It's a notably different art form, and its differences can seem quiet in contrast to these other forms of media. We'll never develop a framework for fully understanding what manga is, how we experience it, and how it impacts Japanese and global culture if it and its discourse remain secondary to anime and other art forms. Manga criticism shouldn't just be about old titles or what other people say is good. It should involve examining new titles, the stuff that's being made right now, to fully appreciate its range as an art form. To wrap things up, Ito Go worries that if critics and readers don't develop a way to fully acknowledge all manga for exactly what it is, the medium will never achieve its full potential. And even if it does, will lack the ability to identify it. He doesn't mince words. To end this chapter, he writes, The lack of framework has limited our perspective and kept us from dealing with reality. In turn, this inability to deal with reality makes it hard to find an opening of thinking about how to construct a theoretical framework in the first place. Our manga discourse is stuck in this vicious cycle. To escape from this negative feedback loop, that is our task. Hey, thanks for watching. Your encouragement is really appreciated and it's what keeps us going, so if you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe or drop a comment below.